Good day. <clears throat> My name is Adele de Goede. In this module, we will go over how we should prepare for a general anesthetic for cesarean section, specifically for a rapid sequence induction, maintenance of anesthesia, and finally, the recovery period. This timeline puts the sequence of events during a general anesthetic for cesarean section nicely into perspective. Note that, ideally, in the best interest of the mother and the baby, we should aim for the induction of anesthesia to be done in under 5 minutes, with the delivery of the baby during the next 5 minutes, and with the whole procedure not long, lasting longer than an hour. This means that the surgical team, including the scrub nurse, surgeon, and surgical assistant, should be present and ready at the time of induction. The graphic on the right hand side of this slide illustrates the time to desaturation after the onset of apnea in the pre-oxygenated patient. A healthy 70 kg adult has up to 8 minutes available until saturation drops below 90%. Now how, note how moderate illness, starting at the lower saturation of 94%, decreases this time frame to 5 minutes. A healthy child has no more than four minutes until desaturation occurs, and an obese adult has less than four minutes. The difference in time span till desaturation in these examples are due to the increased VO2 of the sick adult and children and the decreased functional residu residual capacity in the obese patient. In pregnancy, there is a combination of loss of the FRC and increased VO2, putting patients at an even higher risk of rapid desaturation after the onset of apnea. For any caesarean section, you should have an 18 gauge or bigger intravenous cannula for vascular access with preferably ringus lactate or another balanced salt solution connected. If the patient is actively bleeding or at increased risk for bleeding, a second line should be placed that should be a blood giving set. Both intravenous cannulas should be large bore, meaning 18 gauge or bigger. In terms of monitoring, the non-invasive blood pressure reading should be set on one minute cycles for the first 10 minutes at least. In addition, standard SASA monitoring must be in working order and placed correctly. This refers to a 3-lead ECG, saturation and functional capnography. Patients must be placed in left lateral tilt using a 15 degree wedge to avoid aortic cable compression by the gravid uterus. Prophylactic antibiotics should be administered 30 to 60 minutes before the incision. At delivery, give 2.5 units of oxytocin intravenously, slowly, over 30 seconds. Then add 20 units into a full liter as slow infusion at 125 mls per hour. This should not be the fluid that you are using for volume resuscitation. When assessing patients, always go through the patient's medical and surgical history, general examination and special investigations. Focused anesthetic history entails all previous anesthetics, the type of anesthesia received, any anesthetic complications or bad experience, and a family history of any problems with anesthesia. Also review the partogram. The presence of hematuria might indicate possible uterine rupture or low platelets. Even if, re even if the reason for hematuria is obs obstructive labor, this may give you a sign that the patient has probably been in labor for some time and might be behind on fluids for that reason. Look out for other signs of dehydration, for example, a low blood pressure, higher heart rate or concentrated urine. If there is vaginal bleeding, consider the need to do a general anesthetic, as the bleeding might be due to abruptia placenta or placenta previa, in which case there's a good chance of the patient being unstable or becoming unstable during surgery. Remember, prolonged labor is amongst others also a risk for postpartum hemorrhage. You must always evaluate 
the patient's airway. If you assess the airway as potentially difficult, you should refer the patient or call for help if you are not skilled in dealing with the difficult airway. In case of a difficult airway, spinal anesthesia becomes an even bigger consideration, but you need to be confident that you will be able to get the tube in if something goes wrong. Using the LEMON method, which consists of look, evaluate, malampati, obstruction and neck mobility, you can quickly and easily evaluate the patient's airway in an emergency. Firstly, look if the mouth can open, and this refers to the malampati score in the top right position. Secondly, look if the teeth are okay. Specifically, look for the presence of an overbite, which can be an indication of a small jaw, a small lower jaw. Thirdly, can the neck move? The middle right hand diagram refers to the Dalilkin warning sign. If the patient is unable to lift her chin during extension of the neck above the level of the occiput, this is a danger sign. Also during this test, you can evaluate the thyromental distance, which should be at least six centimeters. And then lastly, evaluate if you will be able to depress the tongue during laryngoscopy. So there needs to be a significant or adequate space um, in the lower jaw to depress the tongue into. Again here, you can ask the patient to uh, protrude her lower jaw above the upper jaw and this will give you an indication of uh, adequate uh, lower jaw and space for that reason. Amongst the drugs that's needed to prepare before a general anesthetic, uh, please note the following. With regards to inotropes, please prepare either one of the following. Ephetil, which is 10 milligrams in an ampule, you dilute this into 10 mils, which gives you a 1 milligram per 1 mil solution, of which you give 1 mil at a time. For ephedrine, the ampule comes in 50 milligrams. You dilute that into 10 mils, which gives you one mil uh, is five milligrams, and you give one mil at a time. Phenylephrine would be 10 milligrams in one ampule. You dilute that into 200 mils of normal saline, mix that thoroughly, and of this you give two mils at a time, which is 100 micrograms. Prepare your induction agent, which would usually be propofol. Saxomethonium for rapid sequence induction as a muscle relaxant. Oxytocin will be given at 2.5 units initially over 30 seconds to 1 minute and then 20 units in 1 liter over 6 hours. Intravenous morphine will be given at between 5 and 10 milligrams. Also have available adrenaline. One milligram in a 200 ml bag, you start with two mils, of which is 10 mics at a time, and double the dose until you get a response. This will be needed uh, in the event of uh, hypotension that does not uh, respond to usual inotropes. A non-depolarizing muscle relaxant is usually not necessary, but if you use a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant, you must prepare reversal, um, which would consist of glycopyrrolate at 0.4 milligrams and neustigmine of 2.5 milligrams. For rapid sequence induction, your induction agent can be propofol or etomidate. Rocuronium should be used if there is a history of scoline apnea or any other contraindication to sucks. Wait for fasciculations after sucks and then intubate. If using rocuronium, use the rapid sequence induction dose of 1 to 1.2 milligrams per kilogram. Wait one minute, then intubate. There will not be any fasciculations. Apneic oxygenation refers to passive oxygen flow to the patient. During rapid sequence induction, there is no bag mask ventilation. 
Your patient needs to be positioned properly before you start. There should be a wedge under the hip or the patient needs to be at a 15 degrees left lateral tilt. The head is placed in the sniffing position. Especially in the obese patient, proper ramping is essential as is shown in the photo on the right. The aim is to get the ear at the same level as the sternum. This enables the straight line from where you must be able to visualize the vocal cords during laryngoscopy. Full monitoring must be applied and in working order. Pre-oxygenate the patient. Remember the decreased FRC in these patients, thus you can expect rapid desaturation. For this reason, you want to maximize the amount of oxygen in the FRC. Rapid sequence induction is performed because of the high risk of aspiration. Cricoid pressure must be applied to prevent passive reflux before the ET tube is secured and checked for the correct position. Just to recap on pre-oxygenation, pregnant patients have a decreased FRC, thus will desaturate quicker. You do this by waiting for five vital capacity breaths with 100% oxygen or waiting for the expiratory fraction of oxygen to reach above 85%. Rapid sequence induction needs to be performed because of the increased risk of aspiration due to the increased abdominal pressure, decreased lower esophageal sphincter tone and increased gastric volumes. The induction dose of propofol must be calculated in advance and administrated while cricoid pressure is applied. Straight after the induction agent, sucks is given, you intubate, the cuff is inflated, you confirm the tube's position and only then is the cricoid pressure released. Please Google the Obstetric Anesthetist Association or Difficult Airway Society 2015 document for the detailed management of the unanticipated difficult airway. The main take-home message from this algorithm is that you only get two attempts at intubation. This is because of the increased risk of airway trauma and resultant airway edema caused by each attempt. Between attempts, you are allowed to gently back mask ventilate to ensure oxygenation. If you are unable to intubate, you can insert a second generation LMA, preferably one with side port for suctioning. A cricothyroidectomy is only performed if you cannot bag the patient. Look at that algorithm and get familiar with the steps like the use of the LMA and whether to proceed with surgery or wake the patient up. It is very important to make sure that the correct dose of muscle relaxant was given from the start, as inadequately paralyzed patients can contribute to the can't intubate, can't oxygenate scenario. During maintenance of anesthesia, you continue to ventilate with air and oxygen plus your volatile at 0.5 to 1 mac. No opiates are given until delivery of the baby and unless you need to blunt the intubation response in patients with, for example, PET or eclampsia. Then you have to inform the pediatrician if opioids were given. If required, you can give small doses of intermediate acting non-depolarizing muscle relaxant. After delivery, Give 2.5 units of oxytocin as a slow bolus. Keep the volatile at half to one mac. Give morphine at 0.15 milligrams per kilogram slowly. Very important. Don't allow the surgeon to close on hypotension. Communicate with the surgical team and tell them your concerns if the patient is hypotensive. If the patient's blood pressure is low while they are closing, the surgeon will be unable to identify bleeders. Later, when the blood pressure recovers, these bleeders become evident and can cause a postpartum hemorrhage. Please note that saturation below 95% is already a danger sign. Start looking for the reason why the patient's saturation is less than expected. Make sure that you have an adequate post-operative pain plan. 
refer to this pain out protocol where pain management already starts in the pre-operative period with the preemptive administration of paracetamol along with the pre-meds that's described. We've already covered analgesia that should be given intraoperately. Postoperately, remember multimodal approach to analgesia, analgesia that should include paracetamol, non-steroidal analgesia if there is no contraindication to that, morphine plus odansetron and lactulose to cover for the side effects of opiates. Take-home medication for these patients should include a balanced analgesia in the form of paracetamol, non-steroidals, for example, brufen, plus tramadol. During the recovery period, continue monitoring the patient for heart rate, blood pressure, and SATs. Manage the recovery period using ABCs. A and B refers to oxygenation. Is the patient awake enough to maintain her airway, or do you need to keep ventilating the patient and arrange for ICU admission? In the case of post-op nausea and vomiting, is suctioning available? C stands for fluids and blood products. Monitor and manage bleeding potentially from the wound or vaginally. Identify and treat hypotension. Monitor the state of the uterus for atony. You can repeat 2.5 units of oxytocin and increase the oxytocin concentration in the infusion. D for drugs, refer to analgesia and antiemetics prescribed, as well as continuing the 20 units of oxytocin in a full vacuoliter, running slowly at 125 mls per hour. Then, how do you know if the patient is ready to be discharged to the ward? The ALDRED score looks at heart rate, saturation and blood pressure that must be near normal for at least 20 minutes since any last intervention. Observations need to be measured every 5 minutes for 1 hour. At discharge, make sure that bleeding, pain and nausea and vomiting are all controlled. After a general anesthetic, the patient must be awake and strong with normal power. Take our message, prepare and know your patient's airway. Please make sure that you are familiar with the rapid sequence induction technique. Remember to monitor for bleeding. When you are ready to extubate, make sure the patient is fully awake. And please take note of what needs to happen during the recovery period. Please refer to this list of abbreviations. Thank you.